Good morning, everyone. My name is Deirdre Denman, and I'm the marketing coordinator at ENM. Thank you for attending our webinar this morning titled Industrial Identification RTLS Product Line Focus. During the webinar, you will be muted. Please type any questions or comments into the Q&A box, the chat box, or you can email us at webinars.com. I'd like to introduce your presenter for this morning, Mike Dalton with Siemens Industry. To get us started, good morning, Mike. Hi, Deidre, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Mike Dalton. I'm um, part of the, I'm a sales specialist for the industrial identification portfolio of products here, Siemens, in the West. Um, I've been at Siemens about nine years or so, and uh, uh, all my career have been sort of a wireless uh, specialist and um, excited to join this group because it's still wireless and it uh, allows me to use the phrase, it depends a lot when people ask questions. So with that, um, I think we'll get started. I can advance the slide. There we go. A quick look at the agenda. Um, first off, we'll look at some of the industry trends with in, uh, involved with industrial identification. A very quick uh, summary of what we offer in our ID portfolio. And then we'll get into our real-time location system product line, or RTLS, uh, which is the, the, the main focus of uh, today, because it involves several applications, but also um, a new application that we've uh, developed related to the COVID-19 situation and uh, things like spatial uh, distances and, and uh, tracking and so forth. Um, then we'll show a quick video that shows uh, an RTLS system in action, shows you how things are being tracked and moving around the screen um, using uh, software that we call location intelligence or middleware. And then of course we'll have Q&A at the end. So um, I believe though that uh, if you have questions that pop up during the presentation, please feel free to submit them via chat and we'll see if we can tackle them in real time. Otherwise, uh, there's certainly a Q&A at the end. A uh, recent survey of manufacturers uh, asked a key question of what are some of the major challenges that you face in production and global production? And by and large, the winning answer there was a lack of transparency. Getting as much information as possible so that you can make correct decisions, intelligent, intelligent manufacturing decisions related to, across the board, related to your supply chain and so forth. But collecting the data points that give you uh, that, that high level of transparency. Some of the trends in the industry related to uh, industrial ID, you see terms such as industry 4.0 and digitalization. Uh, of course, the industrial internet of things and big data being bantered about. All these are uh, related to the trends that we see out there in bettering the time to market and having a high level of flexibility in our production, as well as uh, without forgetting quality and efficiency. So these are the sorts of terms and the sorts of directions that the industry in general is heading towards and that we feel that uh, industrial identification can assist with. As I said, full transparency. So getting to know your manufacturing process better, where things are located, how much material is in your warehouse at any given time, where it's located within the warehouse. Again, collecting the data points that give you a higher level of transparency that you might have before so that you can get more efficient in your day-to-day -day production. And along those lines, what we have for industrial identification products uh, really kind of falls into three categories. OID, which is optical identification, RFID, and real-time location systems. So three different sort of categories, each are good at particular things. And as you can see from this table here, um, if some of your requirements, uh, for example, would be to write data to assets as they're being tracked through your plant. Uh, you can't do that with an optical ID system, but you can with RFID, and you can sort of do that with RTLS as well. Uh, do you need line of sight between a reader and an asset tag that's moving around about the facility? And the answer with optical is yes, because essentially you're using a camera 
it has to see the asset that you're that you're reading and um, not ne not necessarily the case with RFID or RTLS. Uh, do you need real time tracking? And only RTLS can provide that. And then um, do you need uh, information printed on the asset? Uh, you can you can or can you read printed information on the asset? You can do that with optical ID, uh, but not RFID and RTLS. So it's important to, to identify and know the right tool for the job, for the project at hand, for what your application is, and what you need to do in your production facility. Another way to look at those three categories, OID, uh, you can read barcodes, QR codes, text, even the form or the shape of the asset that you're, that you're reading. Um, you can read via direct marking on the product, printed labels, dot beam, uh, but you do need that line of sight, as I said before. With RFID, we have two categories of RFID, HF and UHF, and by and large, the key difference there is the distance between the reader or the antenna for the reader and the asset that you're trying to read and possibly write to. Uh, you can also do bulk reading so that a large number of assets that could be on a pallet could be read at the same time in a UHF uh, scenario. Various tags and labels, uh, a, whole, a whole assortment of those that um, are selected depending on the environment you're in, whether you need high temperature, whether it's a small tag, a large tag, et cetera. So it's, it's flexible in that regard. And then finally, what we're going to focus on today is the RTLS uh, category there. Um, the term is the location in real time, so with an accuracy of down to one foot. There are different technologies, one for an indoor approach, one for an outdoor, say a, a bus yard or a train yard, something like that, and we'll get into those a little bit, but this allows for um, active real-time tracking of those assets and requires a transponder on the asset that is a powered transponder, so it's not passive like in an RFID tag scenario. It's, a, it's an active transponder that's pinging back to the infrastructure or the gateways as we call them. Key to remembering um, the difference between RFID and RTLS is in the RFID and OID environment, you're typically trying to identify what this asset is as it's passing a point. Let's get information on what, what it is. We know it's in, in the building, we just want to figure out what it is or what what uh, contents have been added to it, for example. In RTLS, you're more looking for that real-time location. Where is this within the facility? Down, again, to that one-foot granularity. Here's a quick summary of how RTLS works. As I said, you have the infrastructure devices, we call them gateways, and you can kind of think of them as Wi-Fi access points or something like that. So they're deployed around your facility, whether it's an indoor application or an outdoor application. And then the assets that you're trying to track are affixed to with a uh, transponder. Transponder is an active transponder, so it has a power source. That can be a battery power, or it can be a version of a transponder that we have that we'll talk about in a bit that can be uh, fixed to um, a vehicle that has 12 volt DC or something to power that transponder. And these transponders as they're moving around are triangulated by seeing uh, three, at least three gateways. Um, it's, uh, we get better granularity if you can see four gateways, but they do the job of triangulating, getting the information from the transponder and then passing that information upstream to um, a server where we have our location management software. Accuracy down to a foot, as I said before, this is a very scalable solution. So you can start out small, tracking assets in a small area, and then simply by adding gateways, provide the RF coverage that you need to do tracking over larger areas. And you can also add um, assets to be tracked by simply adding transponders to them. So once you have the gateway infrastructure in place and you've established your RF coverage, it's simply a matter of uh, how many transponders you're tracking, where they are, and you'll get all that information reported through the gateways and up to the location ser management server. 
at least one of these gateways needs to be kind of hardwired connected via Ethernet. Uh, but if it's not possible to connect the other gateways due to the size of the facility or, or those sorts of things, they can essentially establish a mesh, a wireless mesh network, find each other and communicate back to that location management server uh, wirelessly through the gateways that the gateway or gateways that are hardwired to the network. So that's in a nutshell how RTLS works. And again, if you have questions as we're going through, feel free to jump in. Another way to look at it here is you have a level of infrastructure, the gateways, talking to the transponders on the assets or items being tracked, um, and then reporting up to various um, head end software systems such as ERPs and MES systems um, from our locating server, our locating management server. So again, collecting transponder information up to the gateway level through the server and then to the higher level systems that you might have on site. The items involved in, in RTLS deployment involve transponders, gateways, and locating manager, as I said. Various form factors of transponders, um, including a little circuit board transponders that we call OEM transponders that can be fitted into vests or helmets or uh, wearables of, of other sorts so that even people can be tracked. And we'll get into that here in a little bit more when we start talking about COVID-19. Um, and then the gateways, which are the infrastructure devices and the head end system of software that resides on your head end server to interpolate the information, translate it into more graphical and GUI information that uh, can be seen on a screen. I mentioned the different types of transponders, and here's a look at them. Our, probably our most um, popular is the asset transponder. And that has a battery source and can be um, affixed to all sorts of ve vehicles, robots, um, uh, different uh, production items as they move down the assembly line or are moved around the warehouse. Uh, it's quite small. It's about three inches by one inch by one inch and uh, a long battery life there. So with an IP54 rating. We have a direct power transponder, which is used for AGVs and vehicles, uh, forklifts, anything that has a power source, for example, that can be used to power that transponder so we're not in a battery environment in that, in that, with that transponder. Uh, IP65 reading, and we use uh, typically an external antenna to increase distance with that one. We also have what are called e-paper transponders in a three-inch screen and four-inch screen version. And these can be fitted to bins uh, again, AGVs and robots, uh, vehicles, and then on the screen, information can be changed as, say, uh, a bin moves through a production facility and parts are removed from it or parts are added to it. It can reflect that change in, in state and um, images can be displayed there that give you an idea of progress or possibly warnings and things like that, too. So those are the key transponders. And then we have the OEM transponders, which again are quite small and are made to be um, housed in oh, wearables or vests or helmets and so forth. And I think we even have a, I think we even have an example of that here. Uh, so here we have how we've used some OEM transponders with other partners. Uh, we put them in hard hats, or they put them in hard hats. And they can track people for safety concerns and those sorts of things. We've also put them in um, tools. And sometimes you lose tools. Sometimes you want to track how a tool is used um, and see if it's being used in the most efficient manner. So those circuit boards can be fitted into all sorts of different housings. And including down on the right here, you see uh, applications for wearables in, in the form of a pendant or a watch or something like that, too. So uh, quite flexible. They do need to have a power source. So if this is something of interest, uh, any housing that you put them into has to have a battery to power that OEM tag or transponder. 
There is different technology used um, depending on whether you're outdoor trying to do an RPLS tracking application or indoor. And they have different terms applied. So outdoor is known as PWR or two-way ranging. It involves the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band, which is the same as the Wi-Fi frequency band. And the FCC um, says that for outdoor applications, you have to use the 2.4 gigahertz band for RTLS. Those are their rules. Indoors, we have the flexibility of using what's called ultra wideband. And that is a combination of three frequency ranges, 2.4, three to four gigahertz, and six to seven gigahertz. You can see the differences um, in performance and range and so forth between PWR and ultra wideband uh, in accuracy, in range. Now you can use PWR indoors as well, and some customers want to do that. Uh, so that's why you see um, the list here in the middle that says PWR or TDOA, which is used in the ultra wideband. So um, range is another big difference between the two and the number of active tags that can be supported in TWR versus ultra wideband. So the difference in, in technology by and large um, determined by, in part at least, by the FCC rules that, that say which frequencies can be used where. Here we have a look at the information that comes out of the tag through the transponder. So all this information is being sent to the gateways. You have uh, listener package info. You have a package source. You have the ID of the specific tag, uh, the wireless address of the tag. The actual location, localization data, which is the XYZ coordinate. So you're, you're pulling all that information out of these transponders as they move around, including battery status and timestamp information. So this is what the kind of raw data that is passed up to the gateway and then onto the location manager server. We take that information, we can do data exports with that information. Here you see a, a bunch of line items of the different tags. We can then put those through a SQL database and, and categorize them in any way we want um, and present that through the screen of the location management uh, server like this. You see the blue squares, which are the gateway locations, and then the round circles, which are the transponders or tags that are uh, moving around the facility as they change their location. And we'll, we'll have a live demo of that or a video of a live demo of that to give you a better idea. But again, all that information that you saw from that serial string of data, it's the battery status, you know, the changing the, the e-paper displays if, uh, if that's required if you're using that particular transponder. And at the same time, you can create geofenced areas, and that's kind of designated here by the color-coded areas. So you'll know when transponders are passing in and out. They'll be timestamped how long they were in that geofenced area, when they moved to the other geofenced area. And you'll see on our video how it's easy to uh, adjust the size of those geofences and establish them. We also have, and this is part of that reporting of that information, we have a, a, a higher level of the software or middleware called location intelligence. It takes that information, that same serial information from the transponders, and not only um, presents them in this format where you see the geofenced areas and where the locations are, but also um, provides a nice dashboard that gives you further information on the tag. So you'll know where a particular tag is uh, at any time, and you'll get a, a pie chart graph here, how much time um, that tag spent in a particular geofenced area. So this could be useful as we start talking about COVID-19 and you know people are spatial distancing and um, how much time they're spending maybe too close to each other or in an area that tends to be uh, a, a key hallway where too many people have to funnel through too close together. So that sort of information can be really translated through this location intelligence software and put it in a nice, um, nice graphical representation for you. 
you're able to see which tags are free, their battery status, again, without trying to read a serial string of information, um, nice and user-friendly here. Tag IDs, the serial numbers of the tags, and you can assign tags to different projects, to different geofence areas, to different assets, um, and get all that information reported. Some of the applications we have here for, for RTLS, this is actually a uh, combination application here, for, uh, generally in logistics. And very simply, for RTLS, all we're really doing is tracking where that forklift is within the facility. And as it's picking up goods and passing through, say, a, a RFID portal, um, the goods are being tracked, the assets are being tracked uh, by RFID tags on those crates and boxes and pallets. Um, but from an RTLS perspective, we know where that forklift is at all times as it passes that, that RFID portal. Is it going to pick up another load? Is it moving around? Is it a, in an area where it shouldn't be? Um, again, defined by geofence areas that um, could help out in a safety application. Speaking of safety applications, uh, this is a great application for RTLS. You have transponders either, say, in a hard hat that we saw earlier or in a vest, and you know where your people are at all times. You've got areas designated as hazard, potentially hazardous. Uh, you can give them warnings that, uh, say, on an e-paper tag that flash to say, hey, you're not supposed to be in there. You've been there too long. Um, and then have all that reported to the location manager file reports, get events and alarms, um, and really kind of uh, dissect where uh, the workers have been spending their day and if anyone has been kind of roaming into inherently dangerous areas. Another RTLS application is tracking large parts. Maybe this is a um, rent-a-car fleet and you want to quickly, at, at a port where they're delivering new vehicles and they're just tons and tons of cars out there. You want to locate a particular vehicle uh, quickly, and this would be a good application for RTLS. We'd have a, a tag or a transponder on that car, whether it's a battery-powered one or probably be the battery-powered one. We've covered that delivery area with RF coverage, and these tags are reporting up to the gateways. How often they report is some a parameter that you can set, so that ping interval of the transponder reporting to the gateway and giving the information it needs to give is completely selectable by you. The more you use the ping, the more it potentially affects battery life. So depending on what you're trying to do, and if this is the application, these cars aren't moving around a lot, you would have a very long ping interval here, but you'd at least be able to um, find that vehicle quickly. In this application, we saw the OEM transponders potentially fitted in a tool, and this is an interesting one because not only are we tracking where the tool is and not losing the tool, but we're tracking the movement of the employee around the vehicle as he is uh, tightening various nuts and bolts in the five or six stations he has to do for every vehicle when they come by. It's also possible to tell the tool to change torque settings for those different locations around the vehicle. So. Very good information, and then, as you can see down in the bottom right corner here, you've got uh, the traceability of how that worker moved around the vehicle. Did he do so in a the most efficient manner, and did he hit all the points he was supposed to hit? So all that information being reported to the location manager, and again, take, keeping track of torque settings and so forth. Ah, pop quiz time. You might have seen that on the agenda. So we have a couple. Three or four questions here that uh, hopefully, as we've gone through, you were able to pick up the answers to. <clears throat> the first one is how many RTLS gateways are recommended for accurate read? A, B, C, or D, one, two, three, or four. Think about it for a second. I'll give you a few seconds, and uh, hopefully uh, that sunk in when I went over it. Correct answer is four for the most accurate reads. We can actually triangulate with three, as you might imagine, but four is what we try to design to when we're doing the uh, device plan for a facility. Next question, 
which is the correct RTLS technology to use in outdoor applications? Is it the ultra wideband or two way ranging? You see the frequencies listed there. And again, this is by, by and large virtue of the FCC rules for this. Correct answer here is the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band or two way ranging. Third question, RTLS can achieve an accuracy down to one inch, one foot, five feet, or 10 feet. Choose wisely. Correct answer here is one foot. And that is done with ultra wideband in that indoor application. We don't have that level of accuracy uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz flavor of the product, the TWR product. Uh, but this would be in ultra wideband. Final question, I believe. Which technology can use utilize e paper displays to show images and text? Was that in the brief summary of RFID or is that an RTLS technology? Correct, it's RTLS. Very good. Thank you for, part, for participating in that. Um, I'd like to kind of shift focus a little bit now and get into the topic at hand with RTLS as a potential help in restarting the U.S. economy uh, and industry through its real-time location system capabilities and, and uh, social distancing and so forth. We have a lot of challenges ahead in this current situation, and uh, number one is probably employee safety. So how can we assure ensure appropriate social distancing? How can we monitor the interactions with the employees, between the employees, and how long they've been close together, maybe within that six foot range? And how can we improve the confidence of the employees, the unions, and the executives to accelerate this and, and really get the plants back to more of a state of normalcy? So we have a solution with this product. Uh, via a new algorithm we've come up with where the employees could um, wear an e-paper tag as one option in the solution that uh, is wearable on the vest or the front of their uh, clothing. And if the social distancing um, ranges are exceeded or you get too close, in other words, uh, you could potentially see that screen change and flash with even a red flash uh, to, to let employees know they're standing too close and they need to exercise some safer social distancing. The RTLS software will create a history of that. And if, even if an employee then gets sick later on, all their past interactions can be reviewed and uh, see not only where it took place in the facility, but who was involved and even be a, uh, in a an assistance with uh, tracking, tracking who was talking to who and, and um, knowing who some of the people were that might have to get looked at as someone has become sick. Another challenge is just generally in restarting the production of the facility. How can we ensure the production line changes that we've made are optimal? So by tracking uh, the progress and the efficiency using RTLS, we can say that maybe this workstation being repositioned here isn't the best for um, the efficiency of our production line. We probably need to shift it over a little bit, still keeping in mind the social distancing and so forth, but this will help, RTLS can help, uh, will gather those data points and provide that transparency that allows the work situation to be analyzed, to be optimized, and uh, while monitoring the movements of the employees. Particularly a key thing, a key times like shift changes where you have gangs and gangs of people trying to get in and out of what typically could be a narrow doorway or hallway. Uh, so these, uh, we feel RTLS can be used to optimize all that. Another challenge uh, that's ahead is, is making smart investments. We're talking about providing an infrastructure to track these COVID-19 situations and track potentially people processes, efficiency, and so forth. But how much is that going to cost our facility to, to get that level of RF coverage in it? And how can we best utilize this new data 
And then, you know, maybe down the road when that, when the COVID-19 situation backs off and eases off a little bit, we don't want to be in a situation where we've dumped all this money into infrastructure that's only used for one application. So the nice thing is that even if that does happen, COVID-19 goes away, uh, you've now got a system in place that can be used for other tasks. Maybe you're not necessarily going to track personnel as much anymore, but you can still optimize your production uh, efficiencies. You can um, do, you can utilize tools such as a digital twin that can uh, gather those data points and, and more efficiently set up that production line and so forth. And Siemens even has a finance arm that can offer financing to, to help with this. If, if uh, that's not clear in the very beginning that you're, you're, uh, you can use this for um, other applications after the fact, we can help turn that CapEx into an OpEx cost. So keep that in mind, and, and um, uh, this is a, a good solution, we feel, for thinking outside of the box in this COVID-19 environment that we live in today. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Now I'd like to- Hi, Mike. Uh, yes. Mike, um, we had a question. Um, what is a typical length of time to design and implement a solution for, let's say, a 100 by 100 factory floor? We can do that uh, very quickly with, say, um, about an 80% accuracy simply by having a site plan to look at that has dimensions and so forth, and then information on what's in the facility. Is there a clear line of sight? Are there, is there rows and rows of shelving that may be a little bit more of a challenge for us and take more of those gateways to provide the ample coverage that we need? But generally speaking, um, if we have that kind of information, we can quickly turn around uh, a device plan, um, say within a matter of a handful of days, uh, that has about an 80% accuracy. What we like to do after that, though, is kind of walk the site and do a site survey so we can tighten that up and nail it down a little bit better. But start to finish, you could perceivably have a site plan or a device plan um, with the help of a site plan done in a handful of days. And we can very quickly give you an order of magnitude on the cost for a bill of materials involved to provide the coverage. Okay. Okay, so hopefully um, that gave you a quick look at the level that we can go to in. Um, tracking those transponders, and um, hopefully that is, uh, gives you an idea of what we think we can do in the COVID-19 situation and do for uh, providing more data points and more reports on the whole topic of social distancing and, and tracing after the fact. So with that, I will uh, open it up for some further questions if you have them, and I really appreciate your time today.